for the most part, we try not to touch the business for the first six months, maybe even up to a year. Mm -hmm. Get everything resettled. Everything's fine. Everyone realizes we're not, you know, terrible people that are going to come in and bulldoze the company, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, okay, what can we go to work on? And the way we think about that is the lower the frequency and the higher the impact, the more we want to operate in that space. Mm -hmm. So if it's low frequency and high impact, example would be uh, rebranding a company, building a completely new online lead generation program. Um, maybe re-incentivizing the sales team, hiring a new chief technology officer, right? These are things that are very low frequency, hopefully, if you do them right. Um, a business shouldn't have that competency in-house. So the more that we can see across a portfolio, right? We have thir 13 portfolio companies. We see a lot over them and we can locate talent on our staff that is unusual to have in any one of the businesses, but that's helpful to all the businesses at various times during the life cycle of the business. All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Brent here with me. I thought a great place to start would be you are somebody who is pretty well known with tech entrepreneurs, with the investment community, and with what I'll call boring businesses or <laughs> traditional businesses. Yeah. Um, how do you decide where to allocate capital in terms of uh, those different buckets, but also in terms of where you think that you can gain an advantage or somehow drive outsized returns? Yeah, well, when you look at our firm, Permanent Equity, it looks like we're a generalist firm. So we've got investments in manufacturing, construction, and business services. We own a military recruitment firm. We own a matchmaking firm, which we can talk about, like really diverse group of companies. You look at these and you say, what, what could those all have in common? We consider ourselves specialists in what we call adolescent businesses. So too big to be small, too small to be big. Um, these are businesses that are Main Street America. Um, they're doing, they're building pools, they're building fences, like I said, doing real things. Um, and we like to get involved with people who want to do things long-term. So we have really long-term capital. Um, typically we're involved in three plus million dollars of earnings. So much higher revenue than that. Um, so these are not like small businesses, uh, at least what, you know, like the bagel shop, but it's, um, these are legit companies and we try to be good long-term partners and good long-term stewards. So typically buying them with no debt, um, no intention of selling them and um, try and treat people really well long term. So before we get into how you guys do this, let's talk about some of the businesses. Uh, we, maybe we can start with the pool business, which is one of the older businesses that I think that you've owned for a while now. Describe a little bit as to like what that business does and why that fits the mandate of what you guys are looking for. Yeah, so we always have these uh, kind of short ways of thinking about these businesses. So we said people have been dipping their bodies in water for pleasure for thousands of years. We think they'll continue to do so. So we're not worried about some new app or AI, you know, adjusting the market in such a way that's going to cause people to not want to, to uh, throw a pool party in their backyard. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the baseline. Uh, we think Phoenix, Arizona and Tucson, which are the locations of the businesses, we think they'll probably grow and it's only getting hotter. Mm -hmm. So out there, you know, you think about a pool in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. it's a luxury item, right? Mm -hmm. You're typically going to use it a pretty short period of time a year. You get further south, you're going to use it more often. Phoenix, Arizona, it's like a utility. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have people who, uh, you know, have fairly small homes who still want a pool because it's the only way to cool down in the summer, keep their kids entertained, make memories around pools, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we got involved with that business in 2016 um, and really just helped them continue to grow the business and modernize it. Um, you know, we think a lot about, we call like quality of earnings and not just quantity of earnings. So you can look and ultimately the quantity will show up, you know, as a function of the quality over time. But in the short term, it's kind of hard to tell. And so with all these businesses, we're trying to get in there and think about, you know, how do we create stability to serve their customers, to be a great place to be an employer, to serve our uh, suppliers really well and be a good long term partner to the community. And mm -hmm. so that's what we try to do. And when you talk about modernize the business, is that like a technology and tools type thing? Is that like, hey, we want to go in and train, whether it is the management team or, or their employees? Like, how do you modernize it? Yeah, so there's a layer of business we call it the everything tastes like chicken layer, right? Which it doesn't matter if you're doing matchmaking or pool building or recruiting for the military. It's going to be the same set of tools that you need across the uh, uh, across the firm. So marketing, advertising, uh, lead generation, sales, um, technology stack. So, you know, like what's your software that you're using? Accounting, finance, um, HR, and then kind of benefits, the back office type things. Mm -hmm. So if you look at all those, no business has ever been good at all of those things. No small business, at least. Mm -hmm. And um, as we like to say, small businesses don't say small on purpose, 
right? There's a reason why they're small. So what we like to do is get involved with businesses who are great at the thing that they do mm -hmm. and maybe need help in these other areas. So mm -hmm. for the pool business, we were able to uh, institute a, a really robust online lead generation program. Mm -hmm. When we came into that business, basically weren't generating any leads online and they just weren't high quality leads. Mm -hmm. We were able to come in and help them build that new program and now well, online leads are the dominant way in which they get business. Mm -hmm. So things like that. I mean, of course, reorganization of the management team. Uh, mm -hmm. When we came into the business, there was a lot of people doing kind of overlapping jobs. And we said, hey, totally reasonable when you're smaller. As you start to get bigger, you have to specialize. Mm -hmm. So we're asking people about, you know, what is the next in line success, succession planning look like for the business? Um, you know, can we separate roles? Can we get more uh, specialized talent in different roles? Things like that really proud of that team. They've done a great job of, of building out the leadership team over time and really uh, building the business. So on a business like this, uh, you all come in and obviously there's a capital injection into the business. Um, and there is a very unique alignment for long-term growth and, and kind of continue to compound capital for uh, that long period of time. Uh, but how much of it is like spreadsheet analysis and uh, understanding of the business and like, let's mo move these numbers versus there are the people components and the ability to, uh, you know, work with a management team. You aren't there every day, right? And how do you kind of balance between like what I'd call like the spreadsheet versus the people? And, and how do you guys evaluate which one's more important? Maybe as you uh, initially look at a company that you might want to actually buy. That's a great question. Uh, for us, and this isn't probably true for most of the industry, for us, it's 99% people, 1% percent sort of the math. Um, in fact, we've joked that if you can't get the math to work on the back of a napkin, it's not going to work in a spreadsheet. Mm. I mean, literally, because we're, we're not using any debt typically in these transactions. Mm -hmm. So the math is super easy, right? It's what do we think the business is going to generate in free cash flow? What multiple are we paying based on that? What type of yield are we starting from? What do we do with the cash? If there's cash that's generated, how do we reinvest it? At what mm -hmm. types of rate of return can we reinvest it? Mm -hmm. But that math, I mean, literally, we could get a piece of paper and, and model it out mm -hmm. in about 30 seconds on the back of the napkin. Mm -hmm. um, the people are infinitely complicated. Mm -hmm. I'm messy. You're messy. Turns out when you get a bunch of messy people together, it's a mess, right? Mm -hmm. And so we really spent, try to spend time. If we're going to partner with these companies for decades, which is our intention, it's going to take a lot of life mm -hmm. to be lived together. And we want to make sure that we're starting from a really good foundation, a good place. And so, you know, oftentimes those discussions will start with the seller. What are your goals? You know, one of the questions we like to ask is if you could wave a magic wand and create the perfect scenario over the next five, 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Some ser sellers will say, look, I want to be out in a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Let's all work towards that. That's a goal that we have. Let's all work towards that goal. Some will say, you know, I think I can give it three to five years. Like, let's kind of keep talking. Um, maybe I can step into an executive chairman role, maybe eventually just be an advisor to the business. Fantastic. What we say is there's no right or wrong answer to any of these. We just want to know where the truth is. And we all want to be on the same page and make sure that truth doesn't change over time. And if it does, like, raise your hand and make sure to tell us. Um, we promise not to surprise them. Yes, yeah, so they promise not to surprise us. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it works out pretty well. Yeah, it's a, uh, what is it like? Happiness is really just expectations and reality. And uh, the, the closer those two things are, ends up actually uh, increasing happiness. Same thing here with success of the business. Correct. Yeah. Um, so that is a business that I think most people would look at as, uh, you know, an atoms based business. It is very much in the real world as tangible. You're building physical pools, et cetera. Um, you have another business, which is matchmaking, which <laughs> I don't think most people are like, I bet you Brent is going to get into the matchmaking, matchmaking business. business. Talk a little bit as to like why this business specifically is unique and, and how you guys think about the similarities and differences between pool building and then the matchmaking business. Yeah, it's a fascinating business. Um, I In a million years, I never would have guessed we would have been in the matchmaking business. Um, in fact, uh, Emily, who leads our deal team, I remember coming to my office and saying, OK, hey, I need you to sit down, shut up. Don't say a word. I'm going to tell you some stuff about this business. You're going to come to conclusions that are incorrect, right? She she sits down and she, I'm like, all right, all right. What, what could she be? You know, she she's, she launches about three sentences and I was like, stop. No way. <laughs> she's like, I told you. And I was like, that's for sure a hooker business. Like that's for sure. There's no way that this is a legitimate thing, right? Not at all. It was absolutely legitimate. It's actually um, it's actually turned out to be one of those businesses where when I think about what the work they actually do. Mm -hmm. It is an incredible net benefit to mm -hmm. the world. Um, they are helping people find the love of their life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not a dating service. So this is not like, hey, set up a bunch of dates for me. This is a matchmaking business, which, again, when I first learned about it, I was like, I didn't know the difference. Mm -hmm. What could it be? 
think about executive search. So if you're in business, you've typically retained a search firm to go hire you uh, some specific role. Typically, it's going to be an executive role. So how does that process play out? You identify what you're looking for. What are the roles, responsibilities, all these different things. You then out, go out, you source a bunch of candidates through a firm, right? That goes out, finds a bunch of people, that contacts them. They say, hey, how, you, how do you like your job? What are you thinking about? All that. The corollary is not exactly the same here, but for the most part, they go out and do the exact same thing. So they say, hey, you know, what are you looking for? What, what's interesting to you? And some people are very broad with it. They're like, look, I'm looking for a man between the age of, I don't know, 35 and 50 who is a professional who lives kind of within 300 miles of my home now. Mm -hmm. That's it, right? Like, great. Um, some people are very specific. We had a, a gentleman who had lost his wife tragically, um, wanted to remarry down the road. Uh, he was an excellent golfer. So he said, hey, not only age and all these other things, but I wanted to be an under seven handicap golfer. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> And you think about it, it's like for his lifestyle, yeah, right? It's something he loves. It's a deep passion of his. He loves playing golf. He loved to travel the world to play golf. So how do you find somebody who not only has all these other things, but also is a seven handicap golfer or under, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you partner with country clubs and you partner with Golf Digest and I mean, a bunch of these publications to try to go out and find this person. You place ads literally saying, hey, if this sounds like you, come out of the woodwork, right? Mm. Sure enough, he's happily married. No you know, way. It's amazing, right? So what they're really trying to do is they're trying to find the right person for you. Mm -hmm. And that can either be relatively easy. I mean, it's always going to be as an executive search kind of program. It's always going to be, you know, a higher level of touch and service and interviews. And um, there's only one introduction at a time. Both have to opt out before you can move on to the next one. So this is not, again, like a dating service. It's not, I'm going to go to a city and set up a bunch of dates. It's not at all what they do. This is, a, this is an in-depth process to try to find you the right person. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I haven't seen the stats recently. I know it used to be 60% of the time, the first person they put in front of you was the right one. That's how much work is done. Wow. 87% of the time, if you sign up for the service, it's called Selective Search, 87% of the time you end up in a long-term committed monogamous relationship. 87% of the time. That's pretty I mean, that's high. incredible. If you think about that for a second. So yes, it's expensive, just like executive search is expensive. Mm -hmm. Is it worth it? Yeah, our clients are thrilled with the results. How much is it? Well, so it sounds shocking when I first say it. And then, and then you got to sit <laughs> Let back. Let me sit down yeah, and be yeah, quiet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sit down for a second. So it starts at about $50,000 mm -hmm. and it, our largest contracts go up of over a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And you say, what in the world to find a spouse? Like, can't you just go on Tinder or go to a bar? Or, sure. I think there are plenty of uh, people out there who um, that doesn't work for. Mm -hmm. And the people who we work with are busy professionals, mm -hmm. um, people who travel a lot, people who have a uh, unusual lifestyle um, mm -hmm. and uh, people who some of them are well-known celebrity types who just really frankly can't meet mm -hmm. somebody without wondering if they're with them for them or with them for what they have. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the price for them is well worth it. And we love to serve them. When there is somebody who is well known, whether it's a business person, a celebrity, whatever. Uh, is there some masking of who they are at first? Or is there just like, you know, hey, somebody contacts you and they're like, by the way, uh, do you want to talk to celebrity A yeah, uh, no. type thing? Yeah, it's incredibly masked. I mean, in, yeah. until the very end, I mean, the, the person's really not going to know um, because what they say is it doesn't matter who the person's name is. Yeah. We're going to tell you about them. Everyone's interests are aligned to make sure that yep. there's a good match there. Mm -hmm. So they're going to talk about, you know, they have an unusual lifestyle. They're traveling a lot. Maybe they have requirements for their job that aren't uh, typical those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, they'll describe the lifestyle. They'll describe kind of the personality. They'll talk to them about uh, generally what they look like. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, if they end up being a match, I mean, there's only one person at a time that's matched. So the only person who knows about that person is the person who's matched. Yeah. It, um, it, it, traveling all the time as an example is one of those things that I think a lot of folks are like, oh yeah, that sounds amazing. And then if you have to think about it, you're like, you know what? I don't know if I want to travel 300 days out of the year. Like, actually, I may want to just be at home. And so maybe that lifestyle isn't for me. And so uh, there are little things like that that I'm sure I'm sure end up being a great filter uh, for the different uh, folks. So we have pools with matchmaking. <laughs> you also have a fence building business. Yeah, yeah. Talk about the fence building business. I think this is like a good example of like literally you guys look at businesses across different industries. But what's going on with the fences? Yeah, so fences. So it's, uh, it's Ace Fence in uh, Dallas, Texas. Um, incredible team started 40 years ago uh, by great family. And um, we think they're the largest fence builder in the country. So they build um, 
wood residential fences. They'll do some metal working. Um, it's a great team. I mean, they do exactly what you think. They just do it at incredible volume. I think they did average like 88 fences a day last year. Um, so huge volume uh, in the DFW area. And um, they put your fence up. Make sure it's sturdy. So 88 fences a day sounds like an absurd number, right? Yeah. Um, are they like speed fence builders? Is DFW area just so large and so many fences are going up that they have like 1% of the market? Like how do you get, because a couple of things probably have to happen there to get to 88 fences a day, right? What, what's going on? It's incredibly on? difficult, right? Yeah. You have to build this business over like said 40 years yep. to get to that. So they're going in and finishing whole neighborhoods typically at a time. So mm. they'll work with a, uh, a builder and the builder will have, you know, they're putting up, say, 500 or 800 or 1,000 homes in a specific area. The fences are typically the last thing to go in. Mm -hmm. So the nuance of it is you could probably try to save money by, by hiring a cheap fence builder, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is if that fence builder is delayed, you, you don't get paid for the house, mm -hmm. right? So actually it being the last thing, you know, our working capital is almost nothing because we finish the fence, the house gets done, boom, everyone gets paid. Right. Mm. So it's a really interesting that's in, in evaluating these businesses. There's a lot of businesses that look one way on the surface. They look similar. And when you dig into them, the dynamics of the underlying economics, the working capital, really the business model in general is completely different. Right. So we're actually we'll do a little bit direct to consumer, but hardly any. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time we're working with big builders and trying to really service their needs to finish out these uh, big neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. When a business has been around for 40 years like that, what are some of the dynamics as you guys come in? I'm assuming there's family dynamics. There's probably people who have been there for a long time who aren't part of the family, but they see this as an opportunity to uh, grab power, cause problems, like like all kinds of the people stuff. Like what, what have you experienced in you know trying to mitigate as much of those risks as possible? Yeah, well, broadly, I mean, Ace Fence in particular, the, the deal, um, the fence company, um, really great family we didn't run into many dynamics there um we have over the years though <laughs> i it's it's funny i have uh i don't know how many hundreds of side visits i've been on at this point i mean i had one where um a guy invited his entire family for over for dinner because uh i offered to buy him dinner and he was like well how many people can come and i was like i thought it was just maybe you your wife we could talk about the deal and he was like well do you mind if i bring a few family members and it was like thanksgiving dinner he hosted on my tab, you know, things like that. That was so like, kind of him. Yeah, it was. It was. I, I was like, oh, that's an interesting, interesting way to get a free dinner. Um, like how, how many people do you think showed up? Uh, it was like nine, I think. <laughs> nine people there. He started arguing about, uh, you know, about family stuff, and I kind of was there, just like eating my food. And I was like, all right, guys, well, did you do the deal <laughs> later? No, did not do the deal. No. Um, yeah, uh, it, it, there are a tremendous number of dynamics. I mean, you can imagine after forty years, um, every business has challenges, mm -hmm. and like I said, every business is deficient in some areas, right? I mean, there's just no way that a business is going to be a 10 out of 10 in every one of the key areas you need to be. Mm -hmm. If we do our job right, the people we partner with, and this is what we're really trying to suss out during the process is, are they really good at the thing that they do? Mm -hmm. And Ace Fence being a good example of that, they are incredible. They are the best in the market by a mile, my, I would argue best in the country, at building residential fences. They have it down to a science, incredible well-oiled machine, still plenty of problems mm -hmm. like anything else, but they have opportunities to expand into new technologies, to expand into adjacent geographies, mm -hmm. um, to create a lot of efficiencies uh, in, in how they work. Mm -hmm. And um, we're excited about that, right? Uh, we want to build for the long term. So one of the things that always cracks me up about uh, people who are like, I'm going to go buy some business is I can imagine, let's take the fence business as an example. Uh, somebody shows up and they're like, huh, you guys build fences? You ever thought doing it in the town next door as well? <laughs> <laughs> right. And I've the owner's crazy like, new strategy. Yeah. Like the owner's like, I've been doing this for 40 years. I literally have thought about all of the, you know yes. what I mean? Like, I, like I've literally obsessed yes. over fences. I can tell you, you know, the uh, uh, degree at which if the fence post is off, what the, you know, uh, the hill, Correct. Uh, you know, degree or whatever. Like, how do you avoid kind of being the, you know, the person who shows up and is like, I got the good idea versus like, hey, you guys actually know what to do. Like, we kind of want to be support maybe to some degree. Yep. Where's the balance there or, or how do you think about finding that balance? Yeah, we just try to take an incredibly high humility approach. And what we say to them, you know, people will ask us, like, what are you going to do for us? We say uh, nothing. They're like, what do you mean nothing? Like, like, count on nothing from us. Nothing other than just being a good long term steward of the business. We'll be great partners to you. Mm -hmm. We'll write you a check. Check will clear and we'll show up 
and we'll try to be helpful to you, but we can't tell you what we're going to be helpful on, right? Mm -hmm. Like until you get behind the curtain, you have no idea. I mean, mm -hmm. due diligence, you know, the, the, the phase before you buy the business where you're trying to really explore what, what am I really buying? What are the challenges with it? Um, what are maybe the opportunities? I don't care how much due diligence, you could be in due diligence on a deal for five years. I mean, honestly, and you would show up day one and you start learning new things. It's just different once you aren't in the owner's seat than mm -hmm. before. So what we try to do is we don't have a 90 day playbook. We don't have a, a goals for the company. When we come in, um, we ask the leadership team, hey, what do you think we should learn? We don't know what you do. You're the experts, not us. Mm -hmm. um, so we're coming in with the exact opposite mentality, I think, than traditional private equity, which is like, hey, we know exactly what we want to do this business. Get on board. We're going to try to ramp this thing up and then we're going to try to sell it within a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the exact opposite of us. So we're just trying to get to know the business, trying to get to know the people, trying to develop trust, because, look, if, if I bought your business, right, and we didn't know each other, it would take you a while for me to say something and for you to be like, is this guy full of it or not? Mm -hmm. Right. Does he know what he's talking about or not? And vice versa. Right. I don't know where the edges of your knowledge are, mm -hmm. edges of your competency. Right. Mm -hmm. So it takes a little while to kind of get to a rhythm. There are exceptions to this, but for the most part, we try not to touch the business for the first six months, maybe even up to a year. Mm -hmm. Get everything resettled. Everything's fine. Everyone realizes we're not you know, terrible people that are going to come in and bulldoze the company. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, OK, what can we go to work on? And mm -hmm. the way we think about that is the lower the frequency and the higher the impact, the more we want to operate in that space. Mm -hmm. So if it's low frequency and high impact, example would be uh, rebranding a company building a completely new online lead generation program, mm -hmm. um, maybe re-incentivizing the sales team, hiring a new chief technology officer, right? These are things that are very low frequency, hopefully, if you do them right. Um, a business shouldn't have that competency in-house. So the more that we can see across a portfolio, right? We have thir 13 portfolio companies. Mm -hmm. We see a lot over them and we can locate talent on our staff that is unusual to have in any one of the businesses but that's helpful to all the businesses at various times during the life cycle of the business. Mm -hmm. So we have a full-time executive recruiter on staff. So all she does day in and day out is help find talent. It's incredibly valuable for her. It would make no sense to locate that at any one of the companies. Yeah. When you think about incentives, one of the things that I've seen you talk a lot about, um, I know that you think deeply about, um, incentives is something that Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Charles Koch, all these people who have built these huge, huge, you know, businesses, whether they are single companies, whether they own a bunch of subsidiaries, whether they're acquiring businesses, like incentives drive so much of what happens in business. How do you think about maybe we can go top down, right? The incentives of your organization in terms of you have some outside capital, but you've done some unique things with the life cycle of the fund, uh, the management fee, et cetera. Like, how did you kind of design the incentives where you felt it put you guys in the best position? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the goal that I've always had is to align incentives as much as you possibly can mm -hmm. up and down the stack, right? So if you think about it, we want the portfolio companies to be focused on long-term cash generation, mm -hmm. right? How do you develop long-term cash generation? You have a good quality and quantity of earnings. Mm -hmm. You establish a great culture and you incentivize them. Hey, if there's a great thing to do with a dollar to reinvest it, if you can invest it at a high probability and a high return, absolutely keep the dollar. We don't want it, right? Mm -hmm. If you can't, the worst possible thing you can do is to hold on to it. So same thing at the permanent equity level, our level, um, you know, we take no fees of any kind, no reimbursements of any kind. There's no cash that comes from either the portfolio companies or from our investors to the GP. So the general partner being permanent equity, the people that do the work on the deal. Mm -hmm. um, outside of, we take a percentage of free cash flow above a hurdle once the cash of the, uh, the business starts generating out. Mm -hmm. Now you might say, well, doesn't that incentivize you then to strip the companies for as much cash as you possibly can? No, because if we think there's a great opportunity to take a dollar and get a 25% return in every subsequent year, we'd be insane to take that dollar out, right? We want to continue to compound that in the, in the businesses. So up and down the stack, right? We're aligned with our investors. They want cash ultimately out of the investment. Mm -hmm. We want to get paid and our, our portfolio companies want to make money too. We're all incentivized to basically reinvest when it makes sense and to not reinvest when it doesn't. And because we're not in it for the fees, right? Mm -hmm. We're not getting that, you know, two and 20, you know, we're not getting the two. Um, we don't have fee, you know, we don't have a, the incentive to raise more and more capital. Um, the interesting part is uh, when you actually, and maybe this is a little bit of a digression away from like sort of the capital stack. Um, I agree 
very broadly with Buffett, Munger, Coke, all these all these people who are you know big advocates for incentives. And of course, we believe in it. We want the right incentives. We don't want the wrong incentives. The thing I think that a lot of um, employers and business owners get into hot water with is they think they're like, okay, I want my sales team to sell more. Well, I clearly, if I just gave them better incentives, they would sell more, right? Mm -hmm. The question you got to ask yourself when you're changing incentives on somebody is, okay, what are the things that they're currently doing Mm -hmm. that I don't want them to do? Mm -hmm. Okay. And am I incentivizing them to do those things that I don't want them to do? And what are the things they're currently not doing that I want them to do? Mm -hmm. And am I not incentivizing those things? Mm -hmm. When you strip it down like that, a lot of comp changes, because I've seen you know, a lot of business owners will, will tinker with all kinds of compensation structures are constantly adjusting all these things. And turns out the people just keep doing what they've been doing for a long time. It seems mm-hmm. like you can't crack that nut. It's because they like what they're doing. The employees are focused on what they're doing. And they're working hard and doing a good job. Yeah. Right. There's not much more you can turn somebody. Right. It's only if you see something in the capital structure, right, in how you're incentivizing them that would cause them to do something you don't want them to do. So Mm -hmm. it's like I would say incentives are wildly important at a very high level Mm -hmm. um, and at a micro level often are not as important as you might think, or at least in the the way to incentivize people isn't going to create the most change the way you think it will. Yeah, it's this weird thing where uh, I have seen sales teams specifically, people will try to change some of those incentives but it's almost like time is being wasted talking about all the incentive changes rather than just getting out and talking to more potential customers, right? Exactly. And so like, yes, you could get another point or two uh, when it comes to the commission, but if you just had spent that time selling, maybe you would have actually made more on an aggregate dollar basis because this the original commission would have actually reaped more because you had more sales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, like an example of that, we, we like across our portfolio broadly to um, have salespeople incentivized based on uh, gross profit and not based on revenue okay. for obvious reasons. Like that's just something when we look at uh, look at a sales team, we're like, okay, is the sales team incentivized based on revenue? If so, we probably want to make a change, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's all kinds of things. If you if your incentive is based on revenue, right, and you cut the price five percent, doesn't really matter to your commission, right? Mm-hmm. It's a five percent. It's not like that big a deal. You'd rather get the sale. If by cutting it five percent, you're eating into twenty five percent of the margin. <laughs> that matters a lot more. So yes. you, again, always want to just align the incentives between the parties to make sure that there's no uh, heads I win, tails you lose, or vice versa. So when you do something like that, like that, I think it's a very tangible example, right? So you go in, the sales team is incentivized on the revenue side. You now are going to say, hey, we're actually going to do it on this uh, kind of gross profit uh, type uh, metric. Do you have to switch the team out? Or have you found that usually you could go in and you explain it and they say, okay, cool, I got it. I understand why this is happening. And you have to maybe explain to them how they can make more money doing it or something. But like the existing team usually can weather and be okay with the incentive change. Or is it something where you go in and you're like, look, no matter how hard we try, we're gonna have to find new people because they're just so anchored on this other system or this other metric that uh, that, that their compensation is based on, which is an emotional thing. Yeah, right? of course. What's been the experience there? Yeah, the experience is um, if you're not changing magnitude of compensation, mm-hmm. people are very flexible. Mm-hmm. If you start changing magnitude is when it gets really weird, right? So we've not come into a company, frankly, and said, oh, the amount they're compensating people, we just need to slash that because we think we should be able to retain more of that profit for Mm ourselves. That's not something we do. We don't think that's a really kind thing to do. We don't think that's long term. So oftentimes what we're doing is we're coming in and saying, okay, look, here's how much you made based on what you sold. Here's the amount of revenue that you um, you you know sold last year. We're going to move you to gross profit. This would have been the amount of gross profit you was sold. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's about in the same ballpark as the amount of money you would have made last year if you do la- this year what you did last year. Mm-hmm. But here's the upside for you. If you can sell more in gross profit, here's how this works out better for you in the long term. And so we're always mm-hmm. trying to show them you're basically not going to go backwards from where you are. And there's mm-hmm. upside from there because we think that as, as you understand more about the gross profit profile of the business, we understand that we think that it'll be better for you and actually, to be honest, better for customers oftentimes. We've seen that a number of times in the business where um, we change the incentive structure for a sales team and actually sales go up. They don't just stay flat. They actually go up because everyone understands what's going on. So we violated one of the rules of the tech industry. We've been using the P word profit. Uh, obviously that is uh, something that uh, doesn't get talked about a lot. I heard somebody recently say that in San Francisco, everyone talks about growth rate, not EBITDA, right? And, and uh, maybe actually and the opposite on Wall Street, everyone talks about EBITDA, not growth rate. Um, 
but in the Midwest, we talk about cash in cash. All right, <laughs> even better, even better. But what, what uh, I remember reading at one point um, early on, uh, the Koch brothers, when they took over uh, Coke Industries and they were going to grow it, uh, there was a specific data point where they basically made, I don't know if it's a legal agreement, but I think it was more of like kind of a brotherly agreement. We are not going to take uh, more than 10% of profits out of this business. We're going to reinvest at least 90% every single year, and we're going to compound this thing. Now, that is like a very strict kind of mathematical formula they came up with. How do you guys think about uh, reinvesting? And then also, it's interesting because you can reinvest in the individual businesses, right? So if your pool business is generating a lot of cash or the fence business is generating a lot of cash, but you also have the ability to pull up it into the uh, GP and then either redeploy it into new opportunities, maybe into other companies that you already own or pull it out of the business. Like there's a couple of different layers to yep. reinvestment versus uh, maybe, you know, uh, um, kind of harvesting that uh, profit. How do you think about that? Yeah. Well, so the nice thing is we're incredibly long term and we typically don't use debt in our transactions. So all the free cash flow is truly free, meaning we can do whatever we want with it. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing starting point. We can talk about examples of how that really helped. I mean, uh, owning an aerospace business as an example in COVID. I don't know if you know this, but aerospace doesn't go down as an industry. It just never goes down. And when you buy an aerospace business in 2019, which is what we did for an industry that never goes down, and then all of a sudden the industry's down 85, 90%. Wow. Right? M massive shockwave through the system. Mm -hmm. um, thank God we didn't use debt and we had free cash flow. It's truly free to be able to, well, do whatever we wanted with, which in that case allowed us to grow a ton. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what did you do there in, like in that situation? Yeah, well, so in that specific one, so uh, Pacific Air Industries and Air Cert are two kind of sister companies. They work hand in hand, um, uh, led by Jason Harp out in Los Angeles. Um, incredible business. They they are, uh, we, we joke, they're kind of like a hedge fund for airplane parts. <laughs> they, uh, they buy large lots. So, you know, um, let's say FedEx is changing out their platforms. They're going to switch from one type of plane to another type of plane. Well, you're buying tremendous number of parts to constantly be replacing, mm -hmm. right, in the different life cycles of these uh, air aircraft. And so they'll take all those parts, spare parts that they had used for the old platform. And instead of like doing a you know yard sale with it and be like, you know, that wouldn't make any sense. They bulk it all together and they say, OK, who wants to buy it? Right. So we're a liquidator of large lots of airplane parts. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll sometimes hold. We actually I, I was uh, with the CEO a couple days ago and he said that we recently sold a part that was uh, we'd had in our warehouse for over 30 years. Wow. Over 30 years to a uh, to a, uh, a group in, in Africa that's uh, flying DC 10s. So incredible how much uh, uh, diversity of airplane parts we have in that business um, because we didn't have any debt. All of our competitors were loaded up with debt. So the model was not only do you have operational debt, but you got huge lines of credit to buy all these airplane parts. And you're trying to, you know, especially when cap capital is cheap, you know, you buy with very little cost of capital and then you're trying to churn them as fast as you can, which mm -hmm. is great until there's a massive slowdown in the business mm -hmm. and cost of capital starts going up. Mm -hmm. So that would never happen. That would never happen. I mean, the, again, the airline <laughs> airplane parts business just never goes down, yep. right? It, it always either stays flat or goes up. Um, and so, yeah, we were in this really interesting spot where we said, okay, we are one of the few people in the industry who has the ability to make reinvestments. Mm -hmm. um, do we want to try to cash flow this out? Do we want to try to be conservative and just kind of hunker down? Do we want to do what everyone else is doing and lay off a bunch of staff and, mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, go into a, a wintry state? Mm -hmm. um, or do we want to go hyper aggressive, you know, mm -hmm. zig when everyone else is zagging? And what we chose to do is that. And so we got aggressive in this little tiny airplane parts business, started hiring some of the top talent in the industry and said, hey, mm -hmm. come join our ragtag group of people and let's go try to change things. Mm -hmm. Implemented a brand new ERP system, basically did like, 10 years of modernization in 18 months. Um, it was incredible to see. And now coming out the other side of it, I mean, the airplane business is not back to where, as an industry, back to where it has been. It probably is going to be another year or two, I guess, would be before it's back fully. Mm -hmm. But we're up tremendously because of the changes that were made and the talent that we've added. Mm -hmm. So having that flexibility, this is where we get a lot of crap from uh, the industry about how can the world can you guys generate, you know, even market returns when the, you know, three turns of debt, right? having a balance sheet that's at least 50% debt is kind of the norm in the private equity business. I mean, that's mm -hmm. conservative 50%. Mm -hmm. Some balance sheets have 80% debt. Mm -hmm. You know, how are we thinking about generating returns when we're not using any debt? It mm -hmm. just doesn't make sense, except for if you look and say, okay, what if the optionality of that, not having that debt, provides the cash to be able to reinvest back into areas of the business? So what we say to our, our portfolio companies to answer your original question was, if you've got a great place to put cash, 
we want you to put it there. So high probability, high return opportunities. Mm -hmm. We absolutely want you to retain the cash, generate those investments, mm -hmm. right? Because in every subsequent out year, we're going to be benefiting from that investment. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a good place to put it, for God's sakes, don't keep it, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Send it back out. And so it's really that simple. We just set a high bar in the in the portfolio and we say, if you can if you can generate better than that with a good probability, go for it. If you can't, send it up and out. You all look at some of these businesses that are tens of millions of dollars that you're going to have to write a check could be single digit millions. I'm assuming if you found the right one, given the capital partners you guys have, you could go after a really, really big opportunity or whatever. How do you spend your time looking for the businesses, right? So, you know, I was telling you earlier that like, I think a lot of folks, uh, when they go look for a home online, it's like, okay, I want a uh, thousand to 2000 square feet. I want, you know, two to four bedrooms and uh, it has to be within this geographic location or a uh, 30 mile radius or whatever. There's a lot of sites where you go look at buying businesses online. You can do the exact same thing, kind of filter with these preset uh, um, kind of uh, constraints. For you all, the constraints seem a little bit less rigid. And so that means that you could look at literally thousands of companies. How do you know where to focus? Yeah, uh, we do look at thousands of companies. And uh, to be honest, this is one of the hardest parts. We have to we have to get up to speed very quickly mm -hmm. on a lot of different industries. Um, and we've seen a lot through the years, right? So mm -hmm. I mean, there's rarely a business that comes to us that we say, we've actually never looked at the specific sector. Um, mm -hmm. Although a business that we're getting ready to buy, we had never really looked at it prior to it. Um, so it does happen. I, I, it sounds daunting. Honestly, how do we find opportunities that come to us at this point? So we have an incredible network that we've developed over time, and we're kind of one of the only players in the industry that does it the way we do it. Mm -hmm. So what we say to an intermediary, right, broker, investment bank is, look, if you're going to show this to 500 people and they really don't care who buys the business, don't don't bring it to us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our tagline that we kind of we talk about a lot is, you know, we're for business owners who care what happens next. So if you care what happens next, I think we're a really good partner. I don't think you'll find a higher quality partner than us. Mm -hmm. But look, if you're going to sell 100% of the business and you could care less about the future of the business or the employees and they're going to write you a check, then like it should just be a straight auction. It's like selling your house. Like, do you mm -hmm. really care who lives in your house after you leave it? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Mm -hmm. Most people don't. I mean, maybe a few exceptions. Um, businesses are a little bit different. Businesses that the entire, essentially generations of family members are working there. Um, the name is on the door, right? These are community employers. These are uh, people who care deeply about way beyond the dollars. And if we've done our job right, um, we have a joke that we like to say, which is if you haven't gotten rich doing it, we're not going to, right? <laughs> so like, we want to buy a business from somebody who's probably already wealthy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if money is the top thing, then we're probably not going to be the right fit no matter what. Mm -hmm. And so that mentality gets the right people to come inbound us. Now, we pay market prices where we wouldn't get a, a deal done. Mm -hmm. But we're probably, if you're going to put it out to bid to a number of people, we're probably not going to be quite the highest bid. Mm -hmm. But the quality of what we're going to offer is a lot higher. Mm -hmm. When you think about buying something from somebody who's already wealthy, and it's a great kind of heuristic, right? Of like, hey, look, if you made money, we have a shot at making money. Right. Uh, but if not, then, then obviously not. Um, how is it dealing with the wealthy business owner and buying their business versus if you were buying it from someone who I'll use wealth maybe as a proxy for sophistication, but maybe that's the, the wrong way to think about it. Yeah. Um, it's looks really like a no, it's really not. It's funny okay. because um, we've met some incredibly sophisticated sellers who are, to be honest, I mean, have made good money. I mean, we're talking about it here in, in the range of like for normal America, good to great. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, these are uh, sort of the low end would be like the chairman of the country club, mm -hmm. right? I mean, th these are like very, very wealthy by any standards, mm -hmm. nationally, internationally to like extremely wealthy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, because if you start a business and, you know, the business we just bought, like they started in their garage, it was nothing for mm -hmm. decades. I mean, they slowly compounded. So this is not somebody who was like, you know, born with a silver spoon in their mouth. I mean, these are hardworking construction people. These are blue collar businesses typically we're getting involved in for the most part. And um, look, the rewards are great that if you can compound something for 40 years, treat your customers well, treat your employees well, be a great community member. Yeah, good things happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it just takes 40 years. Yeah. So if you've got 40 years and a lot of grit and willing to endure a lot of pain, you can actually start a pretty big business, right? So yeah, um, some of them, are very sophisticated and small. Some of them are not sophisticated and large. I would say they're all, if you're gonna start a business and you're gonna operate a business for that long, you're all sophisticated in, in some ways. Mm -hmm. I would say some are more sophisticated like you know book smarts versus street smarts. Um, 
we just love working with people and the difference in geography. I mean, we've got business across the country, differences in culture amongst those. It's so much fun. So what's interesting about this is um, I think it was Forbes recently uh, had kind of a 15 minute video uh, profile. And when they interviewed this guy, uh, and if I remember correctly, I, I believe that he lives in uh, Arkansas. He's the only billionaire in Arkansas, which immediately you think billionaire in Arkansas, right? People start saying, well, what does he do? And so this uh, gentleman, uh, if I remember all the details, it was like his wife's family had uh, a plot of land. And, and the way he described it was the accountant said to them, you're land rich and cash poor, right? Sure. And so they got in some trouble. They basically sold everything off except for this one little six acre uh, plot of land, which happened to have a wood treatment facility on it. And this wood treatment facility, he decided that he was going to try to run it. But he was a lawyer, so he was going to work. Uh, he'd wake up super early, 4.35 o'clock in the morning. He'd go out there. He had one employee. He would help him get re everything ready for the day. He'd then go home, shower, go work his job as a lawyer, do that till about 4.35 o'clock. Then he'd go back, help the guy finish the rest of the work. He did this day in, day out for years. Had a very hard time getting the business off the ground. Long story short, you fast forward 30 years or whatever it's been. And uh, this gentleman is the owner of Yellowwood which is Y-E-L-L-A wood, which is the number one wood treatment uh, products and uh, facility in the entire country, if I understand it correctly. The reason why it's so interesting is because he is now the only billionaire in his state. And so if you're the only billionaire in a state, immediately most of America would think, well, this guy must be balling. He must be driving, you know, uh, a Ferrari. He has a private jet and a yacht and all stuff. I don't know if he does or not, but he has stayed in that same 2000 person town. And a big piece of this was him and his business have basically helped to uh, redevelop and kind of uh, uh, make the entire main street, all of the buildings and, and uh, small businesses, uh, make sure that they're sturdy and that they kind of uh, look nice. They've helped employ thousands of people of uh, people in surrounding areas. They're bringing them into the town, even yep. though only 2000 live there. They took over like an old plant that went out of business. And now they're using it for all sorts of other businesses they're starting, et cetera. And all I kept thinking about the whole time I was watching this, and maybe I'm a weirdo for thinking this, but I was like, the day this guy dies or sells his business, does that town fall apart? Yep. Right. And so you, you mentioned earlier kind of treating your community well. You're an employer in the community, all yep. these things. When you all come in, sometimes the management team stays. Sometimes you bring in an external CEO or uh, maybe the seller is like, hey, I want to be the advisor. We, we need to bring in a new management team. Correct. How do you balance like the success of the business, maybe because they were such a good steward of in the community and they're such a great participant, but this new person coming in like, Maybe they don't have a connection yeah. to the to the town. Like, how, like how do you think about some of the, like the nitty gritty, really weird details of these businesses that don't fit in a spreadsheet? Yeah. Well, one, there's there's a lot of magic to these businesses where mm -hmm. you start picking them apart, and you're gonna get some some really weird results, which is what I think your intuition is pointing towards, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like let's say that a, you know a business has 50 major decisions that you can make about how you're gonna where you're gonna place it and how you're gonna run it and all these mm -hmm. things. You don't know kind of which ones you're you're pulling on when you start making these changes, which is why we are, for the most part, pretty change averse, right? Mm. We want to make sure we fully understand um, sort of the analogy I think in my head is like, you know, a ball of yarn and you start pulling on a thread and you all, you think all of a sudden you're just pulling on a thread and like half the ball of yarn drops off the other side, mm -hmm. right? Same thing with the business, right? Enough stuff starts to break and all of a sudden you get this weird compounding in a bad way that, it, that occurs. Um, yeah, we're, we're very biased towards keeping businesses, in fact, I want to think of this. We've never moved a business, I don't think. Mm. You know, we buy businesses in small town America. Um, some are in large cities, mm -hmm. but some of them are in small town America. And we love it. We want them to be there. Mm -hmm. um, we think that's a huge advantage for the business because they're so deeply embedded. Mm -hmm. There are families that work at these businesses, mm -hmm. right? Um, and to, to get up and out, I mean, it would require a tremendous amount. I mean, I'm not saying we would never do that, mm -hmm. but um, we would think really long and hard about it. And, and by the way, we try to be part of this what does it mean to win, right? Maybe we could just kind of take a step back and like all these decisions are kind of put through the lens of in order to win long-term, everyone has to win. Mm -hmm. There's literally no way, if you actually think about the game theory of it, for anybody, any one actor to win at the expense of everyone long-term. Mm -hmm. In the short term, you can absolutely do that, right? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of like the idea of like one-time games, very finite games. If you're playing a long game, it's really be, has to become an infinite game. Mm -hmm. And everyone around the table has to win. All, this, all the key stakeholders have to win or it's not sustainable. Any one of those key stakeholders drops out, it's not sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. So you think about that and it really forces you to, to put yourself in the shoes of everyone around you and say, 
all right, what are we going to do that's going to help everyone win over a long period of time Mm -hmm. and make sure that they agree that that's the way they want to win. So, I mean, that's part of what we do. We get to know these businesses. We have these types of conversations. We try to talk to everyone. You know, what are your goals? What are your aspirations? What do you want to be doing? Yeah. How can we be a part of that? We've talked a lot about maybe what I'll call like peering into the business, right? So they're running it. You've got the management teams, et cetera, there. Um, Peter Lynch famously, I think, said if you spent 15 minutes on macro, you spent 13 minutes too long, right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, And and many people who uh, will watch or listen to this, they're very interested right now in what the Federal Reserve is going to do or interest rates or inflation and, you know, kind of name your macro data point that they're paying attention to. How much do you guys think about business cycles and kind of external things that are happening, which may or may not have an impact on a specific business, but seem to have a lot of attention from the finance or business world? Does that play into decisions that you guys make? Uh, You know, interest rates on debt don't really seem to make a a difference because you don't take debt. So like, how do you think about the intersection of some of the businesses you own and macro? Yeah, what I would say is um, the macro is always going to affect the micro, but you we're not going to make decisions based on macro. We're going to make them on, based on micro. So what I would say to you is, uh, especially like 2021 was a good example of this. We saw a ton of business models that um, all of a sudden had these giant spikes, right? What happened? Oh, it was just the business model is great. And just, just compounded. It's like, no, it was like, you know, very, very level and moderate growth. And then all of a sudden a giant spike. And now you're trying to sell the business based on, you know, two times the earnings you experienced in any previous year. What could have caused that? Could it have been COVID? You know, and they're like, oh, no, 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 no. It couldn't have been COVID. You know, it's like, of course. No, we right? sell uh, medical masks. Right. It definitely had nothing yeah, to had do with this thing. Yeah, nothing to do with that. Right. <laughs> nothing to do at all. I mean, honestly, we saw a tremendous amount. Now, now that can actually happen on both directions. Right. Mm-hmm. So you got to be able to look at it and say, it doesn't matter what the past of the business is. It doesn't matter what's happened in the past. It's only helpful in being able to predict the future. And mm-hmm. what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, okay, look, from the time we buy it, what do we think without our involvement, the trajectory of the business is on? Mm-hmm. And so we are very interested in what major shocks to the system, what, you know, we're going to look at different events. Let's say we looked at the events industry and we looked at the, yeah, personal protective equipment mm-hmm. industry, right? And we looked at that same thing and we said, okay, what do we think 2020, 2021 is going to look like for those two businesses? Do we think there may be some abnormalities associated with it? Mm-hmm. So it's important you get to know what the major macro events are and kind of how it would affect these different industries so that when you go into them and you're looking at valuing them, you certainly don't want to overpay and you don't want to short people when it's like obvious that, okay, look, there was a stumble because, you know, <laughs> you were throwing events or you were supplying equipment to the event industry or whatever it mm-hmm. might be. Of course, there was like, you know, a year where no one had an event. Mm-hmm. So it's important to think through it that way. I mean, even even interest rates, even though they don't, directly affect us because Mm -hmm. typically we're not using debt in our transactions. Our companies are using lines of credit to grow the business. Mm -hmm. So it affects us there. Our competitors are all using debt, Mm -hmm. right? So when we think about like, I mean, there's, look, there's a lot of times in 2021 that we looked at each other and we said, how are we so off? I mean, we would be outbid by 50%. Well, when capital is basically free, Mm -hmm. right? You can bid some pretty crazy numbers and make the spreadsheet work. Mm -hmm. Um, we thankfully never got there, mm-hmm. but it was tempting at times. So as you're kind of looking at some of those uh, aspects of the macro environment, how much are you all pushing information down to the companies, right? Like I'm assuming that uh, you and your team are better suited to evaluate macro than the average small business owner in America, right? They may pay attention to it. They probably read the news, like all that type of stuff. But We've talked a lot about things that you guys could do, change, uh, you know, incentives, uh, do branding, help with like online lead generation. Like there's very tactical things, but is there any element of like, you're just pushing information down? And I've seen you guys start to do a lot more content online. Some of that seems to be aimed at, you know, hey, if you're a business owner, you want to sell your business, here's kind of how we operate and, and, and kind of inbound deal flow. But also it feels like, man, some of this information that I've seen you guys post, I've listened to some of the episodes, et cetera, like this could be pretty valuable actually for even the companies that you already own. So how do you think about kind of information that you all have and, and getting it out to either future you know, sellers or even the companies you've already bought? Yeah, we think about it a lot. Um, you know, one, we think that content's the only way to scale conversation. Mm. So, you know, we want to have 10,000 conversations with sellers and business owners. Like there's no possible way we can actually do that one on one. So we think that having conversations that we can record, 
things that we can write mm -hmm. that we can then share is a really helpful thing. Um, in our portfolio, we try to share quite a bit. I mean, it depends on the person and depends on the, the cycle of the business, right? If it's just heads down execution, we can share things here and there, but like actually very little is going to adjust from a macro perspective is going to adjust the micro. Now I can tell you during COVID when no one had any idea where this was going to go. I mean, example, our pool business, we thought for sure that pool business was going to go down a ton, kind of say March, April, May. And I remember, you know, we were in touch with that team a lot and, and, you know, it was like, well, let's start cutting prices. Maybe we can pull some demand forward. Maybe we can, you know, fill our pipeline to get through, you know, we had no idea is this pandemic going to last three months? Is it going to last six months? No, no clue. And then all of a sudden the craziest thing happened, which was demand completely reversed and went through the roof. And it was like, we'll get cut the price cuts, like get, get the price cuts off. And like, how are we going to then deal with inflation? So then it was like, mm. okay, the exact opposite problem. So there was a lot of information sharing around, okay, what do we think other businesses are doing in terms of price increases? Mm. How do we think about material availability? How do we think about labor availability? You know, we had this whole issue where, I mean, the government incentivized people not to work in, mm. in the blue collar trades. I mean, we had people come to us and, and, and it's no fault of their own. They said, look, I can make more money staying at home than working. Mm -hmm. What would you do if you were me? Mm -hmm. You know, he said, "Well, <laughs> we'd prefer you work, but you know, totally understand if you if you feel like it's not something you want to do." So there's a lot of these macro headwinds and tailwinds that you got to kind of adjust to. Mm -hmm. Those do we are in a better position than our portfolio companies to kind of monitor that. And there's a feedback loop; it's not just one directional. They're constantly sending us stuff too and saying, "Hey, we read this or we saw this or an industry event that we were at. They did this." What do you all think? Yeah. One of the things that as I invested in more and more companies, the portfolio got larger, uh, I always struggled with was I didn't know where the balance and, and kind of the right way to do it. When you buy a business, people probably want to talk to you, right? Like Brent, I want to talk to him. He's he's the leader of the organization that is buying my business. Um, you all are probably still at that stage, uh, I would think. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, Steve Schwartzman or uh, Sam Zell or whoever who's been doing it for you know 50 years, they've probably escaped that and now it's like hey if you know blackstone's going to come by your business like not very many people are going to demand to talk to you know whoever uh they're probably just gonna say hey you know what, what's your offer who am i going to be working with and, yeah. and, and kind of get the deals done but on the same side like the support of the businesses you have the same 24 hours as everybody else how do you think about okay you want to kind of be the leader that goes and you know shakes the hand of the person you're buying the business from but also you can't answer every single phone call or email like how do you scale yourself like how have you at least thought about this and then also from an organization standpoint is there like a, a threshold that you kind of cross into whether it's size of team or, or number of businesses or something where you go look we got to now have you know a, a portfolio manager and like they're your point of contact how, how have you handled handled this? yeah we've actually already crossed this okay amazing bridge. yeah so even this, better because now you can tell me how you did it yeah this is <laughs> this was this is actually it was a big change i mean i remember getting to the point where there was no way that i could go on every site visit have every phone call mm -hmm. i mean this is probably four or five years ago mm -hmm. um and so now i mean the goal of any business i think is to replace yourself with people who are more talented than mm -hmm. you are you know we have a little bit something different about our model and, and this maybe kind of goes to to something a little bit zoomed out than even with the question you asked, which is how you scale a normal private equity firm is you hire more partners. So partners are what I call like private equity firms in a box, right? Okay. So you, you hire another partner to find more deals, to be able to negotiate more deals, to do diligence on more deals, to negotiate the paperwork on the deals, and then to ultimately operate them, sit on the board of directors post-close, right? So if you and I owned a private equity firm together and we said, okay, we're kind of maxed out. Like, how do we grow? Well, we got to find a third partner and then we got to find a fourth partner and then we got to find mm -hmm. a fifth partner. And this is the same thing like how law firms grow or mm -hmm. um, accounting firms grow. Um, so that's the traditional way of doing it. That's how almost everyone else does it. I don't come from a finance background, right? We haven't really talked about this. You know, I've joked in the past that I'm like the Forrest Gump of private equity, right? Um, I kind of fell backwards into this. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have any of the muscle memory of how a private equity firm should be built. Mm -hmm. So I looked at it and said, well, why in the world would you do it that way? It seems really hard to find people who can do all these things exceptionally well. These are all these jobs that I just described. They're very difficult jobs. And they're very different skill sets. And what I said was, why would we run this like a manufacturing operation, right? You wouldn't expect the welder to do all the woodwork, mm -hmm. right? Like that doesn't make any sense. You say, hey, we want to go out and hire the guy who's amazing at welding. And then we're going to hire the guy who can do carving, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, those are very different skill sets. Same thing in our business. How you talk to a seller 
uh, or a leadership team when you first get in touch with the business, what you ask, how you ask it, how you pursue it, what you push on, what you don't is completely different skill set than how you operate the business post close. Mm-hmm. Now, you want a continuity of information. You want to make sure there's not disincentives or wrong incentives along the way to pass the buck that something's bad, right? But we have specialists in each area. So we have partners, but those partners are over a specific vertical, right? So somebody who's only over the intake of the business. Once that once that uh, business gets to a letter of intent, they fall off. We have a new team that comes in. So we're constantly moving them between these things, which makes it really much easier for me. So instead of being the partner that's in charge of leading a deal, we actually don't have a partner that's in charge of leading a deal. Right? We have a whole team of people that comes around your business. Everyone's kind of like... Uh, I don't know. It's like the, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen or the X-Men or something. Yeah, yeah, it's right. Yeah. Like like you don't want Cyclops to go underwater. Yep. Right. It's not going to be a healthy thing. Right. Yep. We got each person's got their own powers that they are really, really good at. And what we try to say is, hey, here's the kind of an array of people around you at any given stage. You're going to know who's kind of the lead person. Mm. But that lead person is going to change depending on the stage we're in. And then how once you've bought the business, is it the same thing where uh, you basically have used that manufacturing analogy now all of a sudden? you're the owner, you have somebody who, hey, they're gonna help you with marketing if you need help, they're gonna help you with finance, whatever, and there's not really one single point of contact that's supposed to oversee everything? Yes, yeah, so we actually have two points of contact um, that help resource the company beyond that. So we have an operating partner, and we have a financial partner. Mm-hmm. Um, they're creating feedback loops in those companies. So the financial partner's interacting with their financial team, creating financial reporting, reviewing things, uh, providing feedback, sp- uh, trend spotting, all these different things you'd want them to do. Then the operating partner is really becoming the advisor, kind of the more of the board of directors in a box, if you want to call it that, Mm -hmm. for the company. Mm -hmm. And then their job is to then between the two of them to resource the company besides kind of the things that they directly offer. Right. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the person, the operating partner. They're going to have different skill sets. Mm -hmm. But let's say that um, they want to recruit an executive. Right. Mm -hmm. They're going to say, hey, let's get Kelly involved. Here's how Kelly works. What do you think? Yeah, great. Let's get Kelly involved. Then Kelly, who's our uh, lead person on uh, recruiting, she comes in and helps on the recruiting. It's a very specific talent that she's adding to that. Mm -hmm. So their job is to kind of understand the strategy, do the governance, uh, oversee the companies, uh, develop relationships, succession planning, all those things, and then resource the company either from within or or without. Mm -hmm. You've been doing this now for 15 years, 13 years, something like that? 15 years. 15 years? Okay, so 15 years. Uh, You are... Not old, <laughs> which is uh, unique. Well, here's Thank why. Thank you. Because I haven't uh, been called not old in a long time, so that's good. Well, I, I was recently reading something, and uh, I don't remember the exact age, but I believe that uh, Bernard Arnault, who LVMH, yeah, um, I think that he finally got control right around 39 or 41, somewhere somewhere in that range. Yeah. Which many people when i was 21 i was like oh that's real old right yep. now i'm like hey chill, chill out yeah, youngins, exactly. right exactly but he then went on a 30 year yep. run and when you think of doing something and doing it well and being obsessed and focused with it for 30 years you can accomplish some pretty incredible things yep. when you think about what's ahead of you is it just more of the same or is it hey we want these businesses to grow in size and use the free cash flow to buy more business like how do you think about what's like the the next 30 year plan and you may tell me actually in 5 years i'm going to retire and never talk to anyone again <laughs> <laughs> but like what how do you think about the next like 30 years yeah it, well i recently turned 40 so it's been a uh i wasn't going to say that yeah. i was going to let people uh, well, think that you were somewhere between 25 and 55 and yeah, yeah 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 well i i feel like it's to, to to put a flag in the ground and i mean bezos didn't start amazon until he was at 39 40 uh, I think somewhere, I think in like mid thirties, but yeah. Was he mid thirties? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he's a little bit younger than that, but uh, yeah. So it means it's inspiring. 40 is the new 35. It's okay. 40 is the new 35. Yeah. 40 is <laughs> the new 20. No, is that? No, it's probably not the case. Um, yeah. So in terms of the plan, like I didn't have a plan for permanent equity 15 mm-hmm. years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I had none of the stuff that we're doing now was on the radar. Even five years ago, if you if you kind of go back, we had just raised our first fund. Um, in fact, we were actually in the throes of raising the first fund weren't sure if we're going to be able to convert over or not. I mean, it was a it was a stressful time, right? Mm-hmm. And it's gone way better than I ever could have imagined. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like that um I am I'm always interested in thinking ahead of what what could come next. Um, you know, a, a a clear path is to continue to raise capital, to continue to serve our customers well. It seems like everything everyone's happy in the system. It seems like when we created kind of a de novo new way to do private equity, mm-hmm. um which, you know, 
everyone does it one way and you do it something other way, it probably shouldn't work. Turns out it's, I think, working decently well. I think mm -hmm. the model, I'd prefer our model to any other model, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's got legs to be able to continue to grow into the future. Um, we get continually pulled into larger and larger opportunities. You know, ironically, our model works better even up market from where it is today. Um, but at the end of the day, I have no idea where this thing's going to go. And I think uh, always planning and never having a plan is kind of like the ultimate uh, combination. Mm -hmm. So um, I think our model works in other geographies uh, worldwide. I mean, I think there's a real opportunity probably in Germany and uh, in England, um, Canada, we really not touched much. Um, Australia, New Zealand, Japan's got a really interesting economy for, for something similar to what we're doing. Obviously, there's a lot of cultural nuances to moving into those. Um, there's a lot of baggage that comes with moving up market because that's what every other private equity firm uh, has done. Um, and really what we've just tried to do is to say, we're going to do what makes sense. We're going to try to treat everyone exceptionally well. So we always want our investors to know that like whatever we do, uh, we're going to have their back. And the employees at these companies, whatever we do, they're going to have their back. Mm -hmm. So um, I feel like we can't lose, you know, mm -hmm. um, and tomorrow's not assured. So mm -hmm. I have no idea. I'm uh, trying to take it day by day. Everything you've done is in the private markets. You talked about geography and industries. Would you guys ever look at public opportunities to bring private or take a permanent equity public? Like, how do you think about public versus private markets? Yeah, that's a great question. We have looked at a couple take privates. Um, ultimately, we just don't have good muscle memory mm -hmm. for it. Um, there's just a whole nother set of rules. I mean, we're highly regulated now. We've come to a, a big enough size from a capital perspective where we're, I mean, we're regulated like the big boys are, right? Mm -hmm. And um, um, that is its own challenge and its own barrier uh, in some ways. It's costly mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of stressful to deal with regulation. Um, but you know, I think we're doing great in that department. When you get into the public markets, kind of a different level of scrutiny and a different level of of rules and what you can and can't do. Um, I actually uh, looked at a, uh, a take private at one point. This is way in the past, and I just didn't know what I was doing. So I went and met with the CEO, and I, you know, I was kind of getting. Uh, excited about the opportunity and and you know he he kind of made it clear that he was like I'm doing this out of a favor to a friend like I'm I'm not meeting with you because I'm interested in you know your firm helping us at all and I was like okay well you know, great to meet you or whatever and he made like two or three comments I was like man that seems like oddly specific information and he goes oh by the way son I just want to let you know you're now uh, opted out of being able to do anything in the public markets because that's not uh, public information that I just gave to you and I was like, mm. wait, what? And he was like, so if you're thinking about buying our stock, you can't buy it now. I was like, shoot. You know, so like yeah. there's just a whole lot of different set of rules that you yeah. have to go on. And, and, and uh, also it feels like, uh, you know, if you're the newbie sitting down to the poker table and you're playing with sharks. Correct. They, uh, they know exactly what information to tell you. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. So I would say not, not to say that we wouldn't ever mm -hmm. go do it. It's just an expertise that we haven't built up. And, uh, you know. Never say never, but we're, you know we're not sure. In terms of taking something public, I mean, I think the one thing that is frustrating to me, um, there's always opportunity cost to everything. Mm -hmm. You know, we would love to be able to help um, our employees compound their capital mm -hmm. with us, right? Because the way the rules are set up in the United States around um, being a qualified investor and all those things, like we can't take investment from hardly anybody, right? Mm -hmm. There's a very narrow group of people we can take investment from. Mm -hmm. And I understand why the rules are there and we can debate the merits of that. Mm -hmm. Totally get it. Um, it, would, it would be interesting at some point to be able to offer the opportunity to work with us to a, a larger group of people, mm -hmm. but we have no plans for that. Yeah. Um, so it, it, It's um, interesting. The name is Permanent Equity. There are many vehicles that somehow I figured out how to get truly permanent equity with no uh, uh, kind of end life of the fund, right? And when uh, uh, in the Bitcoin world, there is a uh, uh, a fund that is run by Grayscale who's got about three and a half percent of all, uh, I think, of the supply uh, circulating. When the Bitcoin went in or the dollars went in, they're not coming back out. Yeah. And so there's this permanent equity component. But to your point, there's a hell of a lot of rules and also uh, the day to day scrutiny. Right. You know, I'm assuming you guys aren't sitting there trying to figure out, are you up, you know, uh, this multiple or that multiple on a day to day basis. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah with, we don't have to worry uh, about day to day with the uh, with the stock market a little bit different. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I ask people for questions. And so uh, I, I held off. I was going to email and text a bunch of our mutual friends. And I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to subject him to that. <laughs> but I have a couple. Sure. The first Morgan Housel. Yeah. You, you and him. That guy sucks. <laughs> You and him don't get along on the yeah. internet, but I know you guys are good friends. 
<laughs> <laughs> he has no clue I'm going to ask you this, but at what point did uh, the razzing of Morgan begin? He's just he's the he's my uh, he's my fake fake Twitter nemesis. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Morgan uh, Morgan's such a great friend. He's a great guy. We were actually texting back and forth yesterday. It's hilarious. Um, yeah, people people who I just started going after him just because he's such a like he's such a lovable guy and he's so humble and and he's just hilarious to make fun of. He's just like the guy that you're with like you know at a sports game that you just keep razzing on him right yeah. and he just takes it and do people and think fire you're serious people thought i was serious like i had multiple people i've read reach out and be like hey man i don't think it's worth it like you know you know can you just like can you tone it down a little bit like hey what do you what do you have against morgan I'm like what i'm like no no no, you don't understand it's it, it must be the, the 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 worst kept inside joke yeah but, yeah. But yeah he uh he and i are great friends and uh i admire the heck out of him he's a great dude every time i see one of you say something it, it cra- i don't know why but it just cracks me up I'm like look at these two guys and i and i've always thought like i'm sure people think they're serious right yeah. so, so that's pretty good um Twitter in general yeah. is something that you've used. Sometimes you're using it a lot. Sometimes you're not. Yeah. How do you think about uh, not just the firm communicating, but you communicating um, through whether it's social media or, or uh, you guys wrote a book, yeah. right? And so that was a whole process. Like, talk a little bit about your communication with not only business owners, but maybe the broader business and investing community. Yeah, I mean, I think um, over time, just Twitter's just become a source of fun and enjoyment for me, and something that I enjoy trying to help people through. Um, you know, I, at one time, you know, it's like, try to be a thought leader, try to put out interesting content, try to do whatever. When I stopped doing all that garbage and just focused on like trying to help people and put out things that I thought were interesting. And, um, again, content's the only way to attract the right people and repel the wrong people. So, you know, every time you say something into the world, especially when you've got a megaphone, like a Twitter can provide, um, you're going to lose a bunch of people and you're going to gain a bunch of people. And the people you lose are people who don't agree with you or Mm -hmm. don't want what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Um, And the people you gain are more in your tribe. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I've enjoyed it from that perspective. I mean, I met most of my good friends through Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, my life would not be nearly the same if it wasn't for Twitter. Uh, Mm -hmm. I used to joke that I monetized Twitter better than Twitter has. Uh, It may still hold. Um, and really, I would just, you know, from like an encouragement perspective, encourage people to just be who they really are. I feel like that mm-hmm. social media creates this inauthenticity that you want to put a you know, mask on and say, I want to present myself a certain way and my life a certain way. And um, it may work for a little while, but people can tell. And when that gets shattered, I think people people don't care for it. I mean, yeah. I'm curious about you. I mean, you've got a huge Twitter following. I knew you before love, you had lo- any love hate uh, relationship. Yeah. With Twitter. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew you before you had any Twitter mm-hmm. following. Um, I, th- I think that you had more Twitter followers than me. For sure. I did. You, 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 <laughs> uh, did you even have a Twitter account when I first met you? I think I had one, but I hadn't used you had it like a hundred, you had yeah. like a hundred followers or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. How's it been for you? I mean, what's the oh, so, question I mean, it's an amazing tool. I, th- I think your point about like monetizing it better than Twitter has, uh, yeah. I could, sit here and rattle off a bunch of probably friends that I have and mutual friends that we have that they've built their business. They've literally started companies with people they met on Twitter. They've got investors that way. They've raised capital, all these different things, which is amazing from a business perspective. I find the most valuable part is not so much. um, I think a lot about in life is like, there's three groups of people that you can aspire to or or, uh, spend your time with, which is like, there's your heroes, your peers, and then like the next generation. Sure. And I actually, see most people on Twitter, they're trying to get in touch with their heroes or they're trying to engage with them or or enter those conversations. And if I'm honest with myself, I actually think outside of maybe guests for the podcast, because a lot of that has happened where I've just DM someone, they like responded to me or something and and kind of opened the door um, and you shoot your shot. I've actually probably met the most younger people. Yeah. And that to me is a place where like, I, you know, I've thought like, I don't know how I would have met those people otherwise. The peers you meet, you know, and just kind of doing deals or talking to people or, or whatever, the heroes you can read about, see them do interviews, like all that kind of stuff. But it's actually like the younger people. Uh, again, I'm getting to an age where like, I'm probably disconnected to some degree. And so I meet these people and, and it always cracks me up because I can tell, oh, you're from a different generation. They'll hit me with like, uh, uh, we have one person who works with us now I met on Twitter and he'll send me these text messages. It's like deciphering a new, you know, a secret code. Yeah, I can't do it. The first time he hit me with the letter P, good. I was like, pretty good. Okay, got like, hey, you know. I'm, oh, that's I'm, good. I was, I, I was actually like I got trying it. to chew through it myself. I'm like, okay. <laughs> right? And, and he like kept sending me these text messages. And I was just like, 
man, I need to find more young people because like, I hope that we're not putting this in, you know, like actual professional communication. Yeah. Like this is a whole different culture. This is a whole different way they talk about it, whatever. And one of the things that I started to realize was like these young people were taking TikToks that were being uploaded and they were putting them on Twitter. And so yeah. I'm not on TikTok, but like I almost felt like I was getting, you know, a flavor of like, sure. oh, that's what's going on there because I'm seeing yeah. the content here. So I think that's one. The other piece of it is in whether better or worse, like it is that megaphone. I think you said earlier, like content is the way you scale conversation. I'd never heard anyone describe it that way. Twitter to me is maybe one of the best ways to do that because yeah. yes, a podcast or a YouTube writing, you can reach a really deep connection. Yep. But man, if you get a tweet that, you know, takes off, it's really hard to write something that reaches a million people, right? It's hard yeah. to get a podcast with a million listens. And nuance is hard too. Of course. And, yeah. and, so I, I look at Twitter a lot actually as like there's this output, but maybe the response is more valuable. Yeah. And you put things out there all the time and you're like, oh, I am an idiot. Thank you for reminding me. Like I didn't yeah, think yeah. about this or that or whatever. So yeah. I don't know. No, I, I mean, I, I have a, a love hate and I think that the, the, the love is I love chatting with people and getting to know new people. Mm -hmm. And it's been a great serendipity engine. Right. If you want mm -hmm. to think about it that way. Um, the hate is just that uh, when I'm at my worst, it's like a really bad reinforcement of all the things I should not want from the world, mm -hmm. right? It's like, oh, well, I don't feel loved. I don't have attention. So I need to go and get attention online, right? And like that's a it's a very toxic uh, cycle you can get yourself into. So as someone who went through uh, uh, this, um, I now can see it playing out. And I've sent messages to people who privately said, hey, you're not going to listen to me, right? Because guess what? Somebody said it to me and I didn't listen to them. But on the rise up, just remember, there's another side to the hill and yeah. that can be a forced error. That could be an unforced error. That can be a mainstream media thing or that literally can just be like, Hey, you're, you know, you're the darling today because your company's <laughs> doing well. Yeah. COVID happens. Right. And yeah. you know, that big event business you had, nobody gives you anymore. So I think that's interesting. Another person that I was going to message, uh, but did not, cause I knew for sure he definitely was going to give me too much dirt. Patrick O'Shaughnessy. Yeah. Uh, I think I've heard you guys talk about, you talk multiple times a week for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe even multiple times I a day. Him today. All right. Yeah. Um, he has built a whole kind of media empire of himself. Yeah. He's got his venture fund. Uh, you all appear on the outside to come from completely different approaches to investing capital, but you're great friends. Talk yeah. a little bit about whether it's him or other people like that, that you spend time talking with, but they don't actually do exactly what you do in terms of deploying capital. Oh, those are my favorite people. I mean, honestly, I, I don't have uh, great contacts, relationships um, with other private equity people. Um, one, I think is because what we do and how we do it is so weird and different than traditional mm -hmm. private equity. Um, I think in some ways we're kind of like the zoo animal in the private equity world. Um, but yeah, Patrick in particular, he we got we met online, met on Twitter. He had actually uh, put out a tweet. He was like talking about capital allocation. He's like, hey, can somebody talk to me who does capital allocation for a living? And I was thinking to myself, well, I allocate capital like I don't know I'll reach out and I'll say hey sounds great so we got on the phone this is 2014 probably 2015 it's been a long mm -hmm. time and um we got about three minutes into the conversation he's like wait stop what do you do and I said well you know we buy these small companies like how much do you pay for them I was like well you know we pay like four or five times free cash flow and he's like and these aren't like going bankrupt I said no no there's small companies you know they're mm -hmm hard to get access to, hard to run. Everything's hard about him. He's like, all right, stop. I don't want to talk about, I thought we were going to talk about like capital location in the public market. Like, I don't want to talk about that at all. Like, tell me more about what you do. So well, fire away, whatever questions. We asked me like 30, I mean, incredible questions. Patrick's always been, he's got a mind for interviewing. Mm -hmm. And uh, now the whole world can can see it. Um, I still remember when he was like, hey, I'm thinking about starting a podcast. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, well, wonderful turn into anything, you know? <laughs> Turns out it has. Um, but anyway, so he so we chatted and then he was like, hey, can I come visit you? I'm like, sure. I loved having guests. You've been in Columbia, yes. Missouri. Patrick came to Columbia, Missouri. I was going to ask um, about the uh, Columbia, Missouri Pil Pilmigridge uh, <laughs> because I uh, when I tweeted and asked people for questions, literally, I think two different people. I went and I had a steak with Brent in yeah. uh, Missouri. <laughs> Columbia, Missouri. Yeah, I love having I love uh, hosting people in Columbia. So anyway, so he came to Missouri and I mean, I don't know. It's just you 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 jive with certain people. And he's just, he and I have always just been like kindred spirits since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. He came in, we talked for like 13 straight hours one day. And at the end of it, he was like, okay, look, like I want my family to invest. And I was like, sorry to break it to you. Like we don't take outside capital. 
And I remember when you came and visited me in Columbia, this is again, seven years ago, Long probably time ago, yeah. six and a half years ago, seven years ago. Um, I probably said to you, like, mm -hmm. we'll probably ne never take outside capital because yep. I really believed at that time because I thought my choices were either taking a traditional private equity structure. So mm -hmm. two and 20, you know, fee structure with a 10 year time horizon, which would have completely destroyed our business model, yep. would not have given us the right incentives. Um, it was just a non-starter or create a hold co, which has lots of challenges with how you raise more capital. There's, you know, it, you have to value the assets uh, initially if you've already got something started, which we had at the time. And so I just really felt like neither of them were gonna be the thing and we were doing just fine. Like we were making really good money and compounding and um, I felt comfortable that we didn't need to raise outside capital. And then I met Patrick and he blew up my life and uh, in, in all the best ways. Um, but- uh, Well, he also didn't take no for an answer. He didn't take no for an answer. Yeah. So what he said was, he, he's like, Tell me what it would take. And I was like, well, what do you mean? Tell me. Like, he's like, I said, we're not going to do it. And he's like, no, no. Like, you create a structure. You tell me all the rules of the structure. What do you want? How do the fees work? Everything like that. Just make it work for you. And then I'll tell you if my family can do it or not. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, that's a challenge. I get to create a completely new system. Okay. And really, he enabled that creativity. I mean, mm -hmm. without Patrick, I wouldn't have had the creativity to do this. And, um, Anyway, so I got in front of a whiteboard for multiple days and basically sketched out what we have now and presented it to, to him. And um, he took it to his dad and they talked about it. And he came back and said, a little tweak here, a little tweak there, and we're ready to go. And I said, what was the structure? It's the same structure we have today. I mean, honestly, it's uh, so no fees of any kind, no reimbursements of any kind. Uh, so we only get paid whenever we uh, start returning cash back to the investors. Mm -hmm. uh, they get a hurdle, then we get a catch up, and then we split above that. Um, Typically, no debt in our transactions. Uh, and uh, I asked for 50 years on a time horizon <laughs> and actually got 50 years. And then uh, another family that got involved later, their their lead attorney said, I would never let the family agree to 50 years. That's insane. Like no one, no one gets to keep capital for 50 years. And I said, okay, what's the longest structure you've ever seen? Because I could tell he was serious about this. He was like, look, son, you know, it was like one of those, like, yeah. this isn't going to fly. And we're serious. We're serious, right? I mean, and he was a serious man. Like they were a serious family. He's a serious man, and uh, and he said, "I okay, look, one time I saw twenty seven years with three one year extensions, and I was like, sold. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was it. So anyway, that's the structure we have, and that's the structure we have for the first fund. For the second fund, it's worked out great. Um, I got cold feet, I think twice during mm. that process of raising that initial fund. So so Patrick's family says, yes, we want to we want to invest." I said, well, great. I'm like, now what? And he said, well, we know a bunch of rich people. I was like, great. Who knew? You know? Mm -hmm. um, so he started making introductions. And I mean, literally, like, he, his team, to his credit, like, he's like, send me your numbers. We'll actually create a deck for you. Mm -hmm. like, like, they did a lot of work. And uh, we're just incredible partners. He and his father, Jim, are just, both of them, gems of human beings. Mm -hmm. And um, multiple times through the process, though, I was like, I'm giving up. I don't know what I'm going into. It was like, I was exiting a phase of my life and my career where, you know, I had kind of made it right. I mm -hmm. like, we had, we had a great team. We were on a great trajectory. The businesses were working, the strategy was working and we were kind of breaking the thing that was working to mm -hmm. make something new. It was scary. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, not everyone in my office was uh, in agreement that that's the direction we wanted to go. There were a lot of heated discussions um, around what we were going to do. And multiple times I called him and I was like, I just don't think this is worth it. And he's like, stop being an idiot. This is worth it. Here's how it's going to work. You're fine. Like, you know, kind of stay the course type thing. Literally like, talked me off the ledge twice. And so, I mean, truly the, there wouldn't be a, any outside capital. There wouldn't be a first fund. There would be a second fund without, without Patrick and his dad. And, uh, and then we just developed a friendship. We, we created this event called capital camp, which is, it's kind of crazy how the thing, I mean, we just thought we'd get some friends together in Missouri and show them a really great time. The joke is that I run a food and wine festival and Patrick runs an investing conference, right? Um, it's turned into this like really big international event. Like last year we had 400 people from 16 countries, um, a lot of capital in the room and just trying to make this experience. It's in Columbia, Missouri, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing cracks me up more than like people flying in, not only just from like New York, LA, San Francisco, Dallas, you know, into Columbia, people are flying from like Shanghai and Singapore and South Africa and Switzerland to mm -hmm. like Columbia, Missouri. So just have fun. When you guys set up the structure, yeah. uh, a family or a private investor has a lot of flexibility. You also have institutions yes. that have invested. What was that conversation like? 
Well, a lot of institutions said uh, just laughed us out of the room. To be completely honest, especially on the I mean the the, the last fundraise. I mean we were we had we had raised one uh, one fund, but it was pretty small. Um, the initial fund was fifty million. We were raising three hundred this last time, and um, you know they kind of counted that as like the first institutional raise. So that kind of counts as your really your first fund in their mm -hmm. eyes. And a lot of them were just like, look, we don't do first funds, which I, I get it kind of to some degree. But like, if you're going to wait until somebody's already like proven themselves, like haven't you missed the like the real early opportunity to get with them and become like a true partner? So but anyway, there were a bunch of people. And who also first time funds usually outperform. First time funds do outperform. Um, now, there's also a lot of people who shouldn't raise capital and, and all there's that. There's a lot too. of first time funds that also don't perform at all. C correct. <laughs> yes. So we should, you know, in, in all caveats, there may be some survivorship bias yeah. there. Um, but uh, but anyway, so um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people laughed us out of the room. I mean, we had a lot of people who said, one, you're not going to be able to build this in Columbia, Missouri. Like, who the heck would ever live in Columbia, Missouri? And we're like, we're like you're what well, we do, and we think it's pretty awesome. Um, and another one was just like building any firm new is really, really hard. Um, mm -hmm. And I said, well, yeah, but we've been doing this for like a decade already. So you got to remember, like, we didn't just like come up with an idea and say, hey, we're going to raise money to mm -hmm. do, do this. Like we did it with our own capital for like the better part of a decade. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the actually the the ability to go slow. And this is what, you know, I, I have probably two or three people a month who reach out to me and say, hey, I want to do what you do. Um, on the surface, the returns look fantastic, right? The math is not hard. If you're if you're buying something at a four or five times multiple in free cash flow, you're starting with a 25%, 20% yield on that capital, right? And you can grow the business. The returns are incredible without any debt, right? Like that's just the baseline assumptions. Yep. So people look at that and say, well, that's better than I can get anywhere else. Like I should go move into this. I always tell people it's simple. Like there are no secrets like i happy to answer any question that anybody has it's just really hard and judgment really matters if you had given me 50 million dollars two years into what we were doing i would have lost all the money if you'd given me 300 million dollars in five years i would have lost all the money mm -hmm. it's just takes a long time to hone you have to look at thousands and thousands of deals to hone what do you like what do you not like mm -hmm. how you know how do you see these things play out over time mm -hmm. and if you're given a lot of capital, you can just short circuit a lot of that learning mm -hmm. and you can pretend to be good for a while and you just got to get lucky and hope that it all works out. And um, I got to tell you, I'm, I, uh, I've seen a lot of people come and go. Um, there's almost no one who's actually been able to start and build with some some exceptions, which have been fantastic. I mean, we always try to help anybody who wants to enter the industry. We actually try to be helpful to them, which sounds like a weird like aren't they quote unquote competitors to what we're doing? The market's enormous. There mm -hmm. are just an ocean of people out there who need to sell their business. And there's not enough qualified people. There's enough people who would like, sure, you want to give me your business. But like, there's not enough qualified people who really can take that business mm -hmm. and move it forward. And so um, I actually think it's a great opportunity if you're listening to this and you want to get into the space. I would encourage you to try to get into the space. Um, just take it slow. Like really learn what you're doing uh, and it's mostly learn about people. The, the people I think that, that have the worst time and have the most access are like the finance types. The people who, look, just graduated from Yale, Stanford, Harvard, wherever, big MBA program. Um, you know, they know a bunch of people with a bunch of capital. They can raise the money. They've never operated anything. Or if they have, they've been in like a big company or in sort of a bigger organization as like a low tier or middle manager, right? Mm -hmm. That training just isn't that valuable mm -hmm. um, to running it owning and running a small business. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, the way in which the deal process works and operations post close are really disconnected in terms of value. Mm -hmm. So if you're really, really good at finding opportunities and selling investors on how to invest and all this stuff, like you're probably almost by nature not going to be good at the post close operations. So there's all these like stumbling blocks along the way. The path looks so easy. Just find a business that's making two, three, five million dollars, pay four or five, maybe six times for it, God forbid. And uh, then you grow the business and you exit a period later and you make millions and millions of dollars and retire. Like, duh, yeah, just do it. Right. <laughs> like, of course, it's easy. It, it actually is that simple. It's just the stumbling blocks of doing it mm -hmm. are tremendous. And so um, that's been something that's interesting over time to watch a lot of people that are frankly way more intelligent, way more educated, um, way harder workers, I think, than we are. Um, that haven't been able to do it because they've actually gone too fast, too quickly. Mm -hmm. Somebody once told me that operating a business is like looking at a, a beach full of sand 
And when you start walking, you have to try to figure out where is actual sand versus quicksand because it all looks the same. And if you can just, you know, go down the entire beach and avoid all the quicksand, then you'll be fine. But uh, good luck. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've equated it to um, being in a constant knife fight where you just get out of bed in the morning and try not to get knife that day and then get back into bed and do it all, all, all over the next yeah. day. I mean, it's amazing. Like, you know, people look at successful business owners and, and look, you, you can make millions and millions of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Have this incredible free cash flow engine that you can build over time. Like, it's very attractive if you make it. The number of things that can happen to a business and the number of things that I have seen in my career that just make no sense that you just be blown away by. It's extraordinary, right? I mean, we've put so many people through rehab. We've had people who've done all kinds of crazy stuff, have embezzled money. We've had I mean, you get weird stuff in the mail from the government. You're like, well, that law conflicts with this other law. Which law do you want me to follow? That's not our problem. Mm -hmm. you're, either way, you're screwed, right? Mm -hmm. Like you cannot do everything well and so that's where you just have to get into businesses where there's margin of safety you can't use as much debt i mean mm -hmm. you know we haven't really talked about the philosophy behind debt but that's another thing it's like we try to be humble and not only our approach but also in the price we pay and the fact that we don't use debt because we're trying to set up these situations to be the most durable they possibly can mm -hmm. because frankly these small businesses are outrageously volatile without adding any more volatility to the situation mm -hmm. What I think a lot about is maybe in the uh, more traditional tech industry, it's always how high does it go? You're in a power law game, right? And so it's literally uh, you're basically buying these lottery tickets to a degree. And now you try to, if you're a good investor, pick the ones that have higher probability, maybe things that you could help, uh, find the right founders, like all the things that make you know the good lottery pickers good. But you're still playing a power law game. And so it's all about height and, and, and velocity and growth rate and all those things you're playing a game of like, how bad can it go? Yep. Right? Because you're actually buying something, you're paying based on how it's already going, and if it degrades, you lose money. You lose a lot of money. Right? Very and, quickly. Yeah, and, and what I always think about is like, I guess in both scenarios, there's a 1x downside. The difference though is that when you're playing the power law game, the rest of the portfolio can like easily make up for any losses. You actually go into it thinking you're gonna lose 50 to 80% of the time. Yep. When you're playing a game of buying cash flowing businesses, you're not uh, hoping that you lose 1% of the time. You're hoping actually that everything is, you know, flat to up. Correct. And so you have, you know, a, a very different kind of calculation because you don't have that power law. Yep. And so debt obviously becomes a, a whole different game. Uh, and it's understandable why people use it. Of course. But at the same time, some business models can handle a lot of debt, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the predictability of the outcome really is the, is indicative of the amount of debt you can use. Mm -hmm. Most small businesses are highly unpredictable. Mm -hmm. So if you're running a business that has an incredible base of recurring revenue, that's like, you know, let's say that hypothetically you could get a stream of income that we knew exactly how much money we were going to make for the next 10 years. Mm hmm. Like, like no questions asked, backed by the U.S. government. Let's say it's a government contract or mm -hmm. something that's locked in for 10 years, guaranteed there's no outs. The government's going to pay you for whatever your service or product you're doing for the next 10 years. Look, you can, you can definitely put debt on that business because you have high predictability of outcomes, mm -hmm. right? Now, do you want to try to grow beyond that? If you lever it up, there's no capital to reinvest in the business. Mm -hmm. So you can still get yourself into trouble even when things are predictable, mm -hmm. right? If you've got a business that's like what I call a normal small business that's going to go up and go down and you're going to have people leave and you're going to have all kinds of weird headwinds and tailwinds and crosswinds and all this stuff, like putting debt on a business only helps one of the people at the table. Mm -hmm. And that's the investor. Everyone else loses. Mm. You're the only one who wins. Now, in the short term, if you're going to play the short run, you, you can win at the expense of everyone else. And that's what traditional private equity historically has done. I want to paint the entire industry as that because there's some awesome people that are very, very thoughtful and great stewards mm -hmm. that are in private equity that have a traditional model. But traditionally, if you look at the most of, of the industry, the leverage buyout industry in particular, it has been how do we lever this thing with max debt mm -hmm. so that we can put in minimal equity so that this thing works. Heads I win, tails you lose. Mm -hmm. And the tails, by the way, you being not only the debt holders, but also the employees and the executive teams and the communities they're in, the suppliers, the customers, everyone else loses at the expense of the investor. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem like a game I want to play. Um, we want to play again where everyone wins long term. And we think that the actual volatility of these businesses 
where everyone else says that's a weakness, right? Because we had a lot of investors, you know, go back to your question about uh, what did institutional investors say? They were like, you know, I just don't think you can buy these highly volatile small businesses at scale and make money doing it. And we're like, okay, that's a bet, right? What they're saying is we don't think you can do it. And to be honest, on the outside looking in, I think that's actually a pretty reasonable thing to say. When you get close and you say, well, what if instead of the volatility being a bad thing, because volatility goes both directions. Correct. It goes up and goes down. If you don't use any debt and you can handle high volatility, then like our aerospace business, yeah, high volatility down. Now there's gonna be high volatility back up. Mm -hmm. What if you can use that cash flow to reinvest back in the business and catch that volatility on the way up when no one else can? You sound like a Bitcoin investor. Well, there you go. Well, I don't know about that. I, that's a whole other world for me. No, but but it, but it is true, right? Like I, I think that this idea of the volatility, but really what you're talking about is like if you're durable as a business owner because of the way that you bought the business, it, it goes back to, and, and, and it's so funny because I think a lot of times when I talk to people who are doing something that appears to be new, it really goes back to the timeless investing principles. Like you make the money on the purchase, yeah, right? And so purchase could be the price, but also could be the structure in which you choose to do it. And so you guys figure that out. Price and structure matters. Absolutely. Last thing I wanna to talk to you about, uh, the number one question I got was yep. your uh, kind of journey in faith and oh, yeah. a believer in Jesus. Yep. Um, I don't know when uh, you kind of converted, but my understanding is you're an atheist. Yeah. Now you're not. Yeah. Tell kind of that journey, what happened. <laughs> yeah. and, and what I found so fascinating is uh, not only the level of interest when, when I asked for questions, but also uh, it was people who obviously didn't know who you were. Yeah. They, ne they had never seen you on the internet or anything. And so one of the people literally said, I went to his bio and I saw this and asked him about it. Yeah. And I was like, wow, maybe it's something that's not Brent specific as much as it is. Uh, there's this um, maybe human uh, curiosity. Sure. So talk a little bit about that journey. Yeah, man. Um, it has been, it has been incredible. I, um, Let's see here. So I told my mom I didn't believe in God when I was like nine. I've always just been a I mean, hot I was, start, I was a tough kid. I was, I was, <laughs> I was, I was coming in hot, coming in hot. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I actually asked my mom to drive me to the church when I was fourteen uh, because I, I set up a, a meeting, unbeknownst to my parents, with the head pastor at a, at a local church, and I was like, "Hey, can you drive me to this church?" And she was like, Gee, "Is there anything you want to tell me?" Like. Is there a drug issue? Is somebody pregnant? You know, like mm -hmm. what's going on? Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, 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 no. I just have all these questions about faith and uh, met with pastors. Unbelievable guy, uh, super thoughtful, kind, generous, sat with me for probably over an hour. And I just pounded him with question after question. I just could not understand what was going on. And I just said after that, I was like, I couldn't get the answers I wanted. My, my heart was hardened at that point, And I just I was done with it. So from like, you know, kind of 14, 15 through my gosh, mid to late twenties. Um, I was just an atheist. Like I, mm -hmm. I was a, what I would call strict materialist, you know, this world is what it is. It's what we can see and touch. There's nothing beyond this. And, um, that was it. Right. In fact, I made fun of Christians. I was like, come on guys, like the big sky fairy. Come on. Like what, what is all that going on? Like, come on. Fairy. <laughs> like, let's not, let's not go through all that garbage. Right. Um, I thought Christians were dumb. I thought they were uneducated. I thought they, they didn't know what they were doing. And, um, I reached a point in my career uh, where I um, was making more money than I ever thought I would make. Mm -hmm. And I had married a beautiful woman who loved me and everything was just gray. It was dark. Um, I didn't really care. I didn't care about life. I told my wife I didn't love her. Um, I didn't care about anything. Food didn't taste good. Best drinks didn't taste good. It just kind of was all gray. I was like, this is it. Like you make money and then you buy stuff with it and then you just kind of then then you die someday and ultimately you're in the dustbin of history. Like that's it. That's the world. Mm -hmm. It's just like this this real nihilism that had set in for me. Mm -hmm. Just like nothing mattered. Right. And and intellectually, I just couldn't get to a spot where I could figure out like what is morality? Mm -hmm. Like if there's no ultimate authority, then there is no objective morality. Like you can say, I believe in this and I believe in that, but like so what? Like, I believe in something different. There's no ultimate arbiter. And so, you know, everything, again, just the beauty of everything kind of dissipated as I, the more I got into this. And um, the only thing that would, you know, help me was just not to think about it. But then I was like, man, do I really want to live a life that's unexamined? Like, is the only way to live life in a way that I really don't explore the deepest questions that there are out there? And right around that time, um, I look at now as God calling me, started putting Christians in my life who are like way more educated than me. And they started really challenging me on like, you say that, do you actually know what that means? Have you read this? Have you oh, thought about this? Have you done this? And I was like, well, shoot, I thought I was pretty well educated and I, 
I, I don't know. And so I started just reading books and I went from like God being an impossibility. I mean, when I started, my heart was so hard. I was like, there's no way. And look, I had all the things like I had all the, the worldly things that you could want, right? My life from the outside looking in was great. Like I didn't need God. Like I didn't care. Right. Mm -hmm. But there was just this deep longing, right? Um, C.S. Lewis, uh, C.S. Lewis was a major influence on me as I, as I came to faith. He's got these great quotes about like, you know, we yearn for food. There's for, there's something called food, right? We yearn for sex. There's something there's sex, right? Um, the things that we yearn for are reality. And so we all yearn for meaning, which means there is deeper meaning. Mm -hmm. Like the animals, they don't yearn for deeper meaning. Mm -hmm. We do, right? There's a difference. And so I started reading and, and slowly over time, like it went from an impossibility to like, oh shoot, there's a lot of people who are deeply thoughtful and study this stuff to plausible. And then it really just centered around the resurrection of Jesus. Um, you know, so Christianity, just to take a step back, um, it's lumped in with all the other religions. Um, I actually was, uh, I did quite a bit of religious studies in undergrad as an atheist. And, um, you know, I would say maybe to define religion here is, is there's a set of rules. So some, some higher power gives a set of rules about how the world works that some are unseen, mm -hmm. but if you do enough of these rules, you get favor in this life and the next, right? Would you, would you I think say probably, that was a yeah. fair, a fair characterization? Every religion that I've ever looked at, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Right. And that's never been attractive to me. Mm -hmm. Like, how could you know if you did enough of the things and like, I do, I don't want to live life. Like, well, like, I don't know. I, I didn't bow enough. I didn't pray enough. I didn't, I don't do the, I didn't do the right. I order gave 9%, of not 10%. I gave 9%, not 10%. I don't know. I mean, like what, what, at what point do I, you know, click over There's even, I mean, you know, TV shows based on it, the good place, right? Yes, yes. It's like, you know, this ultimate weighing machine is like all the good things and all the bad things. So all that just seemed like, it just didn't seem right. Mm -hmm. Then I experienced what I would call this big realization. I remember the first time I heard what Christians call the good news. Mm. So the good news is God loves you now as you currently are. So therefore follow him, not do all the things to earn God's love. Mm -hmm. So it's the incomplete, it's a great reversal, mm -hmm. right? It's the great reversal. That's why I don't think that actually following Jesus is a religion. It's actually a really interesting, like there's a whole philosophical yeah, debate on this more. topic. Well, if you think about it, it's every other religion says, do these things and you'll get favor in this life and the next. So do these things, the doing, the achieving mm -hmm. is the key to the religion, mm -hmm. right? In Christianity, it's reversed. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's anything I can do to earn God's love. And there's no way for me to lose God's love, right? All God calls me to do is to follow him as the one true king, mm. right? So I'm adopted as a son of the most high king. I'm royalty, which means it's a very odd thing, right? Mm -hmm. But you're royalty under a king who was crucified, Mm -hmm. under a king who preaches humility, who preaches mm -hmm. self-sacrifice, right? Mm -hmm. So it is the great reversal. I'm not trying to give to charity in order to earn God's love. I'm not trying to, you know, not look at pornography or do whatever to earn God's love. Like I think I know now God loves me and therefore I want to follow him because I care about him because I'm in a relationship with him. Like mm -hmm. if I'm friends with you mm -hmm. and I have care for you and you say to me, hey, will you go do this thing with me? Well, why do I do it? Am I doing it to earn our friendship? Mm -hmm. I guess that's one way to look at the relationship. It doesn't seem very satisfying. Well, how do I know if I go on enough trips with you or do enough of the things, am I going to earn, right? But this is a very like utilitarian approach to mm -hmm. relationship. That is what I would call the religious approach to relationship, right? Mm -hmm. There's no achievement in following Jesus. Mm -hmm. The work's already been done, right? Like Jesus on the cross, it's conquering. It's actually the the darkest day. This is what we call Good Friday, right? It was the darkest day when Jesus was was crucified. Looked like the darkest day it was actually his enthronement, right? He was put onto the throne. He defeated sin and death, right? And so, what? It's, when I heard that for the first time, I was like, "That is too good to be true. That just can't. That can't can't happen, right?" Because one, my pride said, "My works matter. Mm -hmm. Like I want to be a good person." Have you ever struggled to be a good person? I know I have. I think every single human, everyone in struggles the world to be a good person, has. right? Right. It's the whole idea of uh, everyone is a sinner. Everyone's a sinner in need of grace, mm -hmm. right? We need a savior. I think as I got older, I also realized when I was young, I didn't need a savior, right? I can save myself. Yeah. I had this whole world ahead of me, right? When I was older, things were going to be better. When I was older, I was going to mm -hmm. know all these things. I was going to be able to do all these things, and I was going to, I was going to not need help, right? I was going to be autonomous, independent. 
And then as you get older, you realize like that's the exact opposite of reality. Mm-hmm. Like we are frail. Future's not secured, right? I mean, I've had enough friends now die. I had a guy the other day. He emailed me at 8, 17 p.m. And he died in the middle of the night. He was 35 years old. Wow. Future's not secured, right? Mm-hmm. We, are, we are way more frail than we realize. And so what it really came down to me was, okay, I heard this completely new way of looking at the world. And there were people who believed it who were deeply thoughtful. Mm-hmm. I can barely remember what I had for lunch yesterday. <laughs> How in the world could I know what happened 2,000 years ago? Mm-hmm. It seemed like an impossibility to me. Mm-hmm. So one of the friends that I had who's unbelievable PhD, and he said, actually, you should go and research that. See what you think. So I just started studying the person of Jesus. And I started, okay, what did he actually say? Because we got this movie caricature of this like mm-hmm. lily white Southern church setting, right? Which is like mildly racist. And like, you know, people are all trying to earn things and, you know, be good. Don't have sex, give money to charity, do all these mm-hmm. things, right? And then behind the scenes, there's like this very cynical view of like everyone's indulging in all these sins and it's all mm-hmm. terrible. And by the way, people are sinners. You know, one of the things that I, I, I heard, I, I think it was C.S. Lewis who said it was like, church is a hospital for sinners not a museum of saints. So if you go into a church and you see a whole bunch of people who you think are like terrible, good news that they're there because you should have seen them beforehand, right? Yes. And by the way, when I started looking at my own heart and I realized how dark I was, Mm -hmm. I said, hey, maybe this is a place for me. Mm -hmm. But in the resurrection of Jesus, I actually found the answer. And, And so if you look at what Jesus said, Jesus thought very highly of the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures that were before him. He said that he didn't come to abolish the scriptures. He came to fulfill them. So he thought very highly of them. So basically the entire religion of Christianity, if you want to call it that following Jesus hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. Mm-hmm. If you don't believe Jesus was God and you don't believe in the resurrection, you're just not a, you're not a Christian. Like I just don't know how to say it. Like you can be something, you can be, you can be Christian like you can, you can be Christian curious. I don't know whatever you would call it, but, but you're not a Christian. Right. And I never thought I would get there. I never thought I would actually believe that Jesus was resurrected. I never thought he defeated sin and death. Like, like the actual literal rising from the dead. Mm-hmm. If you go back There is incredible evidence. We have more evidence for the resurrection of Christ than we do for any other historical event in history. Literally. Wow. You just got to go and do the work. Mm. I did the work. I spent years pouring over. I did not become, it wasn't like I went from being an atheist to all of a sudden it was like some light, like light switch flipped and I was a Christian, Mm. right? Like it didn't work like that at all for me. I had to grind and grind and grind and ultimately realize that the evidence became overwhelming. Do you know the founder of the Aspen Institute? He did the exact same thing. He did it in his 70s, his late 70s. This is a guy who started the Aspen Institute, one of the most uh, Mm world-renowned institutes of knowledge, right? It's this this sort of um, hall of ideas, right? And brings in world-class thinkers from around the world. He, He literally became a Christian in his early 80s after studying the person of Jesus. He shocked everyone. Like Aspen Institute, not a religious organization. Shocked everyone because he did the work. And so... You know, look, I I can tell you that the freedom I feel, the love that I feel, the life that I have, I can't even imagine what my life would be now without Jesus. I can't even imagine. When you went to do the work, what were the one or two things that somebody's watching this to say, okay, I want to go do that too, that you would send them to? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd have them read. um, So there's four gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, I would have them pick one doesn't really matter. They're all kind of written to a slightly different audiences. They have slightly different um, details um, in them. But like just get a basis of just slowly start reading through the Gospels and and find out who Jesus actually was to mm-hmm. start because you're going to have to get a basis of knowledge, right? And, and you can't get it from like popular culture. Mm-hmm. It's just so screwed up. And and by the way, most people, if you ask most Christians actually who say they're, they're like Christians, especially in cultural Christian areas, mm-hmm describe what Christianity is, they would actually probably describe it more closely to what, you know, we would call religion. Religion. Like I'm trying to earn my way to God's love. Like it it is this very counterintuitive and highly offensive thing Mm -hmm. to experience the love of God Mm -hmm. because it levels everyone. Mm -hmm. There's no good. There's no bad. We're all on the same level field, right? Which is highly humbling. I would say you start there. um, And then there are just a number of books about the resurrection. I think the resurrection is the key piece Paul, uh, who wrote most of the New Testament, um, used to be Saul of Tarsus, was a persecutor of Christians, actually killed Christians, Mm -hmm. and then had a uh, experience with Jesus and became um, Paul, who uh, 
was a devout believer and, and, and like I said, an apostle and, and wrote um, most New Testament. So you can look at these different lives, the lives of um, uh, Jesus's half brother, James is a great example of James was, it literally says it multiple times in, in the scriptures, like James was skeptical. James thought like his brother was out of his mind, right? It's like, you can imagine like, what if you're one of your brothers claimed to be God, right? <laughs> He probably has when, you know, exactly punched them. You punch him, right? That's exactly right, <laughs> like, right? Shut up. You come and you're like, you're an idiot. Come on back <laughs> yeah, home, right? Yeah, well, yeah. James did that to his brother, Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Well, then James, who wrote the, 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 the uh, book of James later says, I am a servant of Christ. And by the way, he went to his death professing the divinity of his brother, his half brother. Like wow. there are just these lies and it's really hard to explain it um, other than you have to make sense of Jesus. Either Jesus was who he says he was, mm -hmm. or he was a madman, a lunatic and a liar. Mm -hmm. And like everyone I think has to come to the conclusion of one direction or the other. And, um, um, I can tell you, it's just, it's been, it's been incredible. It's hard to even describe how, how different my life has been. I love that. That's a great way to describe both mm -hmm. religion, but also I think your journey. Um, where can we send people to find you on the internet, find out more about permanent equity, or if they happen to be listening to this and they have a business, they would love to partner or sell to you guys. Where, yeah. Where can we send them? Uh, we're, we're available, uh, permanent equity.com. There's a tremendous amount of information. Um, uh, I'm on Twitter. So at Brent Beach where my, my DMS are open. I try to be active depending on how, what deluge I'm sure you get the same thing uh, It comes and kind of fits and spurts. Um, yeah, those would be the kind of the two primary ways on LinkedIn. You want to look me up there, but um, yeah, you can be reached. I can sure. be reached. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Happy <laughs> awesome. to connect with people. Thank you so much for doing this. I always learn something every time we talk and uh, I love just the approach that you guys take. Uh, the success is kind of the icing on the cake, but mm. I think more people who could figure out how do you play uh, kind of these long-term games, do things uh, hopefully the right way is, uh, is good for the world. So I oh. appreciate it. We'll definitely do it again in the future. Thanks for having me on, man. Good to see you.